there anything else I can get you? I bought another ginger ale. You sure you wouldn't like something a little stiffer? I got something stiffer. Oh, you're here already. Well, I can see what kind of workout this is going to be. I was just getting warmed up. Hi, Kurt. I'm home. Dealing in the gay porno world, you deal with people, they have no concept of being suave and debonair. That's where Chuck Holmes was different. He seemed to have a class about him that nobody else did. He was very concerned about social change for gay people and understood that he could play a unique role. He felt that he had to give back or he would lose everything he had. No one mind getting Chuck's money, but some of them minded where it came from. He's a pornographer. We don't want that porno dirty money. I think of Chuck Holmes very much in the same way I look at Hugh Hefner, someone who admired beauty and wanted to share that beauty with others. In the beginning, Chuck Holmes was a great collector of porn. That's how it all started, eight millimeter loops. It was extremely closeted, and they would have these little parties, like a Tupperware party and a holiday in hotel room. And the customers would come, they would buy them directly while they were there. I was probably one of the first in the business. I was traveling the country, checking into hotels, meeting interested customers, and in one of my encounters back in Cincinnati, Ohio, I met Chuck. He said, oh, I want to get into that business. Oh, I'd love to get into that business. I said, no, I don't think you really want to deal with the feds and postal inspectors and all the other shit. Oh, I want to get into that business and I want to make movies. Six or seven months later, he moved out to San Francisco. Chuck came out of the closet really fast. I don't think everybody ever said, like, come to San Francisco to come out. But it was quite obvious, and that you know, many, many people were uprooting and coming west and landing here. Sexually, it was on fire. I was coming from the Deep South, and I was just blown away by how comfortable people were and how uninhibited they were about their sexuality. I think San Francisco when I came here is gayer than it is today. South of Market, there was a bar called The Hungry Hole that was glory holes where you put your ass through. That's fairly radical. We had all come from very oppressed backgrounds. We went to San Francisco because we had had it with the rest of America. We wanted to be free, we wanted to have sex, we wanted to be gay, we wanted to be queer, we wanted to take a lot of drugs and party. The Supreme Court ruled today that if anyone wants to read dirty books or look at dirty movies in his own home, he may do so, and it's none of the law's business. The law still may regulate the spread of obscenity in public, but the court said a person has every right to satisfy his intellectual and emotional needs in the privacy of his own home, that the law has no business telling anyone alone at home what books he may read or what films he may look at. Depending upon one's own moral posture, this film festival means either more tarnish on the city's growing reputation as the smut capital of America, or a major break away from inartistic pornography. It would be difficult for anyone to deny, however, that erotica, by whatever definition, has become a commercial as well as cultural phenomenon. Mike Lee, Eyewitness News, San Francisco. I came to San Francisco in 72. I went to the BAR, which was relatively new, and I kind of admired the fact that a gay paper was being published. I walked in the door and said, I'm a writer. 
and the editor, Paul Lorch, said, what do you write? And I said, theater reviews with an emphasis on musical theater. And he said, I've got somebody writing those. Would you like to review porn? It was his idea that it was time to be legitimizing gay men's sexuality in its on-screen depictions. The big innovation of the sexual revolution period was theatrical. In other words, in mainstream theaters, in movie theaters, or small storefront theaters. The other way, and this was more traditional and goes back to the beefcake photographers, there was a mail order business. Mail order was selling directly through ads and magazines. They would send in cash many times because they were afraid to even have a record as far as a personal check paying for adult material. It was a small little reel of film, not well focused and not well lit. Body hair was not manicured, dirty feet. They were just thrilled to get anything that was available out there. There just wasn't that much product. That's why he got in business. That's what he always told me. He says, I used to watch porn movies and see those goddamn models and they'd have dirty feet. And I said, I gotta do it better. There's not gonna be a model with a dirty foot within 10 miles of a Falcon movie. A lot of them get into their industry because of this, their sexual impulse, and they don't have much of a craft, of an impulse towards the craft of the medium they've chosen. Chuck seems to have had a natural proclivity, something in him. When he found himself a gay filmmaker, he wasn't a bad one at all. Chuck started Falcon in 1970 out of his home. It probably just seemed like the business to get into in the early days. It was becoming legal when you're the first or one of the first to do something. You could make money on it. He had some friends who were in it, and he always said that I'm smarter than those guys are, and they seem to be making a good living, so I know I can do it. Chuck and I were very close. At that time, I was not only shooting for myself, I was also shooting for Matt Sterling. We met, and he picked my brain. He talked me into shooting all the earlier films. We both put each other on payroll, started Falcon. Right after Chuck and I had met and started things, Vaughn came into the picture. He was the person who went out and recruited the mailing lists. We were just walking, talking, and one day he, he said, what should we call the number? I said, I want a bird of prey. He said, eagle? I said, no. And I said, falcon. I said, that's it. And that's the way we named it. It was like just spitting in the street. It wasn't no big deal. It was just three or four words and it was named. I said, well, I'm going to set you up, give you all the contacts. I want $5,000 and a little percentage or whatever. And we just started doing it. This is when it starts. When Chuck gets that mailing list is when you can first start calling the adult erotic gay industry an industry. Chuck was the business brain behind everything. He was the financial whiz. John Travis was the cameraman. He was the creative aspect of everything. He was the original pioneer. But Chuck knew how to capitalize off this. Sex sells. It just blossomed overnight. We just shot whenever we wanted to. It was nothing planned or anything. We, we weren't making films so people say, oh, they're having good sex or they're showing how sex should be done. We were making it because we enjoyed it. We loved it. And that's what we like doing. They're renegades, you know? They're out there just shooting sex. It's just, it's real guys having real sex. Back then, there were like seven models. And every once in a while, you'd find that eighth model walking on Santa Monica Boulevard. And they kind of all would swoop. They'd have another business, and they would kind of attract models. Like Vaughn had a company called Rugby. And it was a really slick little clothing store in Castro. They printed a really nice catalog. They take photographs of these guys. Dick Fisk comes to mind. But it was always like, well, we have this other business, too, that you could make some more money.
I just went out in the streets and picked them up in bars and cable cars and walking and baseball fields. I just went out and picked them up. Once you pick up a guy, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Is it going to be sex or is it going to be no? Most of the time it was yes. Falcon consistently looked for better and better models, and they always used beautiful locations and outdoor scenes. It was the consistency that the customers knew if they were buying that brand, they were going to receive a wonderful product. It was a new era, and Chuck really helped create that. He was very smart at marketing. He knew what he liked. He knew what sold. He knew to continually build up his mail order list and the name Falcon. Chuck was so competitive, he could move with lightning speed. He could have an idea, he could have it laid out in two days, and he'd print it overnight, he'd be in the mail, while his other friends were still thinking about it. Chuck, in his early career, was able to attain success because he was able to deliver in the brown paper wrapper the films, the magazines that gay America wanted to see in a form that they could actually accept it. Chuck Holmes and Falcon Studio translated the sexual life of gay men in the Sparge cities into a kind of historical record. They were very post-Stonewall. They were reflecting new gay freedoms. The explosion of our lives and our visibility on the streets, in the world, in bars that no longer had their windows painted black, you know, and the movies quickly reflected this. The clone look the lumberjack look, jeans, flannel shirts, mustaches, facial hair. It was the hippie look filtered through a notched up masculinity. We had a rich lexicon of our culture, of the way we lived and what we wore and what we thought about and how we dressed and talked and Filmmakers could put that out, you know, and, and kind of recreate or document our culture. The porn stars are really heroes. At a time where it was necessarily not easy to be gay and not easy to be out. Not only were they like gay and out, but they were like really like putting it all on the table. You know, they were kind of going the extra mile for all of us. Pornography was still technically considered a kind of prostitution. It was sex for money. Anybody who made pornography at this point in time had not only to worry about being arrested under prostitution laws, but still had to worry about obscenity, vice squads. It was a dangerous occupation. Yesterday, the Supreme Court authorized wider restrictions on the exhibition and sale of obscenity. Today, a nationwide crackdown was underway. The explicit portrayal of sex activity has become a big, very profitable business. The Vice Squad goes after it all. We have to understand is it was extremely risky. I mean, people got busted for selling porn interstate and went to jail. They all hid, you know. They all had noms to porn. At the first hint of a bust or of any legal issue, they'd all pick up their TPs and run. The entire industry was anonymous. Neither the performers nor filmmakers were credited or wanted to be known. You had to be very careful. No one knew where they were going to shoot that day until they were going there. It was a secret. It was like the McCarthy hearing for making sex films. They were after Chuck Holmes for a long time because he was noted for fisting movies. He was indicted along with Matt Sterling. The trial was actually in Texas. 
Chapter says is that they showed, I believe it was an interracial scene. The prosecutor said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this could be your son. And one of the women in the jury box threw up. Chuck hired Michael Kennedy and Tom Steele. These are people who defended the Chicago 7. They went to the judge in chambers and said, judge, we feel like we're not getting a fair trial. And the judge said, fair trial, fair trial, Michael. Hell, not too many years ago, we would have taken those old boys out behind the courthouse and hung them. That's what the legal climate was like. Chuck delayed it, and he had it moved finally to San Francisco. Matt Sterling, who wouldn't spend the money, went to prison. Chuck was lucky, but he was also smart. I decided to discontinue shooting for myself because I just didn't want to deal with the entanglement of the feds and postal inspectors. I let Chuck take the brunt. People said, look, I'm tired. He would be a buyer and buy these rights out. You know, some people, it's like a card game. People fold it, yeah, I'll buy you out. One reason why Chuck Holmes thrived the way he did was that he was able to avoid going to jail uh, in a way that some of the other directors were not able to do. He basically built on that and acquired their materials. Chuck loved to go skiing, and it would cost a lot of money. So one year he said, let's just shoot a couple of scenes so we can write it off. On the other side of Aspen, he was extremely involved. He'd want to get everybody outfitted. A lot of my ski clothing is in that original movie. And in those days, they probably had sex at night, I would imagine. Three of the leading performers of each generation, the generations were very short at this point in time, of the gay porn uh, performers. They had Casey Donovan, who was the very first famous gay porn star. They had Al Parker from the second generation, and then Dick Fisk from the third generation. He shot a few scenes, and he brought it back. And he showed it to Matt Sterling, and showed it to me. And we said, hmm, we can make this into something. I said, well, then we need an opening scene. And Matt Sterling wrote the whole thing, and it just blew him away. Well, there you are. Hi, how are you? Been running. Wow, you're really sweating. Yeah, a lot. Have a good time? Yeah, I had a great time. Been yeah. thinking about uh, this little trip I took to Aspen. At that point, they realized that they had something a little different than they had intended. And it was really uh, almost a feature movie. Once Chuck Holmes realized this, he decided he was going to market it that way. And it sent out a brochure, asked for the people on his mailing list to mail in reservations. It was such a huge success that everyone decided to imitate that. It even was more important than anyone realized at the time because once the video revolution occurred, what you sent home was not a clip. You sent out a movie with four scenes. It produced the biggest success of his career. Falcon video pack number three. When young businessman Craig Rand realizes that the cabbie who picked him up at the airport is the incredible Al Parker, he gives in to the bearded studs blatant come on. Along a deserted country roadside, the two men get naked and nasty together. It almost happened overnight that all of a sudden video was the big thing. Everybody was buying machines, everybody was getting tapes, people were sharing tapes, and film just faded out. Everything that was on 8 millimeter got transferred over, so we kept getting additional sales without having to manufacture anything new. I was getting, like, FedEx packages every Monday morning, like, stuff with pounds of cash. I couldn't believe how much money there was. I mean, it was wild. We had advance checks here and advance checks there. Chuck certainly took advantage of that, man. He was on the edge of that. Before you even finish making your movie, you would have 10,000 units sold at 35 bucks a pop. Falcon was noted for having more than that, and his mail order was so incredible and vast, he'd make a fortune any movie he made. 
he didn't hit the door at a hotel or on a cruise ship that he wasn't handing out $100 bills to the help. Boom, 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 everybody. They knew he was coming. Hello, Mr. Holmes. One of the first things you did when you got with Chuck is you got a Rolex, okay? And he, Chuck gave me two Rolexes, a Tiffany watch, a lot of jewelry over the years. He started to refashion you in his image. I had a Rolls Royce of Totus to and from the clubs at night, and another one to bring other boys home or to follow us shopping. He told me, I'm gonna spoil you so rotten that no one else will ever have you. And I was like, bring it. I had a lot of famous friends. I'm just with Chuck, he really got a lot of kick out of it. Steve Rebell of 54, and David Geffen, Hostin, I took him to Hostin's house. He got so much joy out of that type of stuff. Chuck wanted a new way of life. He wanted to be a big shot. You take a look at the Falcon models of 1980, 81, they're all picture perfect. Falcon had the most beautiful models there were. They wanted the most perfectly beautiful faces with the most beautiful bodies and the biggest dicks possible, and they wanted them to do everything, and then some. Long ride, you guys. Did you check that pothole? I about busted my nuts coming over that. Well, I think we should go inside and get on with this initiation. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's go. If you really go back to the first eight millimeter loops, they're all hairy and with mustaches. In the 70s, that was the image that reflected masculinity. I believe the story was Calvin Klein came out with his famous billboard, underwear billboard, I believe in 1979 or 1980. And they were friends. And that whole image changed. It went from uh, machismo to clean cut. Calvin Klein had sent me a box of underwear, a hundred pair of Calvin Klein underwear, and I liked the way the guys look at them, and I started using them. It was not planned. It was just something I liked the way it looked visually. Chuck was not a creative person at all. He was a business person. What Vaughn brought was the sheets and the art and the pictures and, and the orchids. Vaughn could sell it. And when you talk to Vaughn, he'd say, oh girl, just imagine white crisp linens on tan skin. Ooh, girl. He'd sell to Chuck and Chuck could almost, he almost hypnotized Chuck with it, you know? Ooh, girl, yeah, okay, do it. And he'd convince him to spend the money for it. I pick the guys and I take the clothes, cut their hair, pluck their eyebrows and shave them, scrub their feet and bleach them so they had nice white feet, tan them up and oil them down. And then Matt Sterling saw it, he said, you know, this is, this is gonna change the way we shoot film. The thing I remember about Chuck and his productions was he was really methodical about manufacturing the fantasy. And the guys had to be a certain kind of guy. They were always, very white and very muscular and very tanned. Right at this time, the formula is gelling. Beautiful people in beautiful surrounding. The models are getting more attractive and there's some money rolling in where we can spend a little more money on the productions. They were all just beautiful people, the boy next door. There was no dog meat. <laughs> he is the first producer that wanted to depict good, clean, all-American fun. Collegiate-looking guys, brand new socks, pure white underwear. It was a new look that kind of brought the industry above ground and made it clean and fun and wholesome almost. I think they were the first one ever that you knew that that was a class act, if you can say anything's a class act in pornography. The standards of everybody's movie were based on Falcon movies. Well, you know it takes a lot to win. 
Hey, thank uh, Phil for introducing me to Kathy last night. Man, she was a real hot piece of ass. Over half the guys in Phil's office have been trying to get it on with her. I know she's hot for my dick. I could understand why. I was just on my way into the sauna before you came over. Why don't you join me? You'll feel a hell of a lot better afterwards. Oh, what the fuck? Why not? All right. Falcon was just a reflection of Chuck. His fetishes, his likes and dislikes with guys, how he wanted gay to be portrayed in his movies. Falcon was really just right out of Chuck's brain. It was Chuck. He was very uber about masculinity and about boys and about men and about, about keeping things uh, male. He struggled with his being gay. Not so much being gay or saying I'm gay, but having a presence that was flamboyant beyond being appropriate. He never wore tore off jeans. He never wore anything that would give away, you know, the sexuality. You know, you really do have a hot body. Thanks. I try to keep it that way. H have you ever had a blowjob before? A few chicks have done it before. Really turns me on. Have you ever had a uh, guy blow you? No. Have you? Well, maybe. A few times. Could I give you a blow talk? Sure. Why not? The image of that masculine, uh, basic, plain, athletic man was purposely created to combat the image that society had of gay men in the 60s and the early 70s. He was taking that fringe element and dressing it up and cutting its hair and teaching it to speak well so that the general population would overlook the gayness and pay attention to the person to assimilate easier. They would get him out of the Midwest. They would go to great expense, do model searches through people all over the United States, the smaller the town, wherever. Fly them in, build them up. Falcon would put them through the car wash. The idea being that you take somebody and you beautify them and you know, they work out and you know, a uh, little toning their body and the makeup, but before you're done, you've got the perfect car wash falcon star. Seemed like in a lot of cases, they all looked alike. Kevin Williams, Kurt Marshall, that was the iconic look of Falcon. That was the Falcon look. Everybody was looking for the next beautiful blonde. Hello? Hey, Brian. Yeah, how's it going? What's going on? Hey, how about coming over to party? Hey, my buddy Kurt's here with me. You've never met him before, but he's real hot. You'll like him for sure. Anyhow, we'll be right over. Bye. They would strip all the color out of my hair and then just add a beige toner to it. So it would basically be stripped to white and then we would just add a shade of ash to my hair. And it was different versions of that flipped off to the side so it looked like I had this big mop. I had to remain shaved. And even though I make two or three movies a year, I had to be shaven down every day. And in San Francisco, you try to get a date <laughs> with no hair on your body. <laughs> they had this very lockstep, lockdown concept of what masculinity is how it should be portrayed and how it should be packaged, you know, for poor Joe in Iowa that's going to pay $69 for a, a VHS. You know, if I would bring in a fabulous black model, a black model couldn't be just in the cast. There had to be a 
reason for the black model to be in the cast. The black guys were never to get fucked. And the white boys were to never lick the black guy's ass. That's what he wanted. Hey, how Hello. you doing? What brings you over here? I might have thought we can kind of see. Wait, what do you mean? Fuck my wife, fuck this door, I want to fuck you. How does that depiction of sexuality reflect gay men? What does it say about us? What does it say about the filmmaker? What set Falcon apart was that very clean, squeaky clean college student image. That squeaky clean kid becomes piggy when the doors close. And it's that juxtaposition that made Falcon work. He didn't want to see kissing. God damn it, they're kissing too much. Make him fuck that hole and I want to see it open up. God damn it, they're talking too much. Little whoop de woo and get to right to the action. Slap that butt and a lot of butt, a lot of fucking. He was just, ooh, funny. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> he loved it. Chuck always said to me, he goes, honey, it'll stretch a mile for it tears an inch. Believe me. Chuck's surgeons would come to me and they'd say, what's wrong with him? He must have some psychological problem. He must have something going on with him that's really wrong. I looked at myself and I looked at Chuck and I said, there's nothing wrong with him. This guy's normal. He's got wishes and dreams and aspirations and all kinds of ideas that don't fall into the box. Chuck breathed a lot, a lot of energy into his relationships. When Chuck fell in love with someone, it was 110%. As generous as he was, he would not, he wasn't willing to allow the men in his lives a lot of room to express themselves. I had a complicated relationship with Chuck. He was like my lover, brother, father, buddy. It was always extremely complicated. Everybody knows Chuck is an extremely sober individual and who would campaign against alcohol. You know, he, did, he didn't like drinking at all, much less drug use. But the truth of the matter is Chuck had quite a sexing and drug episode in his life that I had engaged in with him, and it amplified itself. And so there were a few years there that I didn't see him all the time. I'm having a wild party in my condo at the Aspen Club. Why don't you come on over? Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty good. Hey, you guys, you won't believe this hot guy I ran into on the slopes this afternoon. I literally ran into him. He's back in the back room. He wants to come up. And he's wearing a mask, and you guys won't mind. It's my friend. Hey, Kurt. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey, guys. Hey, how are you? How are you doing? Chuck was lucky if he could bounce a check. He would spend all the money he had coming in Falcon, chasing boys and going to New York and drugs. He spent up all the money, didn't have anything left. I just couldn't take it anymore, it was just too much. It was not going anywhere. And everything was just going deeper, so I left him. When I saw Chuck in the mid 80s, 84, 85, uh, was I could tell that, you know, by his general appearance, uh, that he was not too well. We left this meeting, we went out to the car, and we got in his Porsche, and he said to me, he started crying. They had diagnosed him with KS, he had KS on his ankle. 
That's when I first became aware about his HIV status. I'm sure he was positive long before that. It was the first time that I had ever seen him frightened because he wasn't that kind of person, but also um, that I really became aware that he was, you know, fallible, you know, and that uh, he wasn't just a superhero. I come from a generation that had a lot of sex in very casual and free ways all over the town, all the time. Having to switch rapidly to a sex life that was prescribed in any way was difficult. We were used to being very freewheeling. That was part of who we were. That was part of our statement of identity. So it was hard to put the brakes on. You could have heard a pin drop down with Castro. Everyone pretended that they were never found bottom up on Dory Alley or any other seedy location. People fled for the closets. They all ran back into the closet. They ran back into straight relationships. Everybody abandoned being out in public. That's just, this is how I saw it. I think that when AIDS happened, it was devastating to this business. I think it scared the shit out of everybody. Uh, when we found out how it was being produced, and of course, when we then found out all of our actors were dying, I mean, I think it changed the industry a lot. Some people went out of business, I think, because of that. It pretty well got me why I didn't want to be in the business anymore. I didn't want to take somebody else's life. Oh man, it was just a very scary time. And I mean, here I am like still groveling down below with the camera and stuff dribbling on me, you know, it's like. <laughs> Chuck would never speak to it like what was going on in our community in a general sort of way. He would do it very quietly. But if you got him on an incident, like that poor guy, whatever, Chuck would break down and cry. But he had kind of a rigid um, uh, front around it otherwise. They were doing everything but using condoms. They were dancing around that issue by squirting non-oxynol 9 up the boy's butt. I would talk to Chuck and I would say, you need to use condoms, Chuck. You have to use condoms. I remember that was one of the big bones of contention with Falcon was that they, they were sort of the last ones to come on board with using a condom. The feeling was that the consumer wouldn't buy a product that depicted condoms. It was performers, actually, who kind of insisted on it but there was great resistance, as there was among the populace. I would hope that he would look around and say, I can't promote this, I can't, you know, contribute to people looking at my movies and thinking it's okay to not use condoms. I did not let up. This was very serious, it was a health crisis, so we talked about it all the time. And I think the only time you really wouldn't talk about it, but when people started showing up very thin, and I just said, you know what, uh, I don't feel comfortable with this. I just can't do this anymore, and I don't feel comfortable doing it anymore. I had to argue with him about it. He said, we can't go to condoms, we go to condoms, we're going to go out of business, people aren't going to buy it. I just couldn't convince him, so I knew what would do it, because... Chuck, for all his being the grand wizard, was also a coward. And I told him, I said, you know what, honey? I said, ACT UP's going to come down here. and You're going to come to work one day, and ACT UP's going to be standing outside that door. And you're going to get called out on this. And that, at that point, he decided we could start using condoms. Coming through this AIDS epidemic, 
I think a lot of people were afraid to have sex, even safer sex, and porn was one of their only sexual outlets. You'd be amazed at the amount of people that have come to me like, wow, you saved my life. I think porn was a safety mechanism. business was growing, I told Chuck, I said, we need to get people in here full time, we need to get serious about this and stop being weekend porno hobbyists. I had brought professional filmmaking people, young kids who really had something to prove. We really had ideas. I was Steven's assistant. Steven and I were very close. He was like my big brother. And we, we would literally pow out every day. Ideas, um, scripts, I was constantly involved with his every day. And I think Steven wanted me very close to be produced together. We added lines, the Mustang line, the Jocks line, the Falcon International line, a novelty line. The Duplication Lab ran around the clock, 24 hours a day. Hundreds of titles were we duplicating in just one day. It was at a time where people were watching more porn. We were making movies like a production line. We were just into distribution, nationally and internationally. It was exploding. We'd have $40,000 bags. Chuck loved the gay porn world. He loved being the jefe of the porn world. I think he made a complete turnaround of his life. He had gotten sober and very serious about it, watching his weight, health conscious. He was the kind of image you would look up to. You could tell he was a very successful man. He carried himself well. He was real confident. He had whatever he wanted. <laughs> I mean, he owned Falcon. We've been incredibly lucky. I started in this business sort of accidentally in 1972, as did my friend Jack Defoe, better known as Matt Sterling, and John Travis down there, who had just told Jim Hodges to me. <laughs> Some of us go way back. To the days that Peter and John were the word of snakes and reptiles on the earth. But to be that as it may, we were all lucky to be here. Some of the best have gone on the world. I think we've got a few more licks in us, and I want to thank you. Thank you. He taught me so much about what to be and what not to be. You know, he was a very lonely person, very lonely and, and not satisfied. Early on, I thought money brought satisfaction. Chuck taught me that. It, that's not the case. He lived on the hill, and he had all the money, and he was not a happy person. We would travel on planes or go places, and people would say, what do you do? Videotape replication. And for most people, that would be like, OK, great. Anyway, it's nice out, isn't it? You know, they would keep them off track. And I would always question them, like, what is videotape replication? <laughs> what is that? It's making tapes. Well, yeah, but what kind of tapes? You know, if someone's going to ask you, well, they haven't yet, Mary, so quiet. He was never really comfortable with what he chose as his, his career. You had to test the water before you told somebody what you were doing. You know, it wasn't completely open. He used to tell his society friends, I'm in the mail order business, and they'd say what? And he'd say, well, I sell, you know, tchotchkes tchotchkes and things like that. So, so people around town used to call him Crystal Holmes because she saw crystals and things like that. You don't laugh. They all knew what he did. I don't know if Chuck was proud to be a pornographer. I don't think he was embarrassed by it. It certainly afforded him a lucrative lifestyle. I don't think that he ever felt accepted by society because of society's negative feelings towards the porn industry. He would come through the main entrance and all the offices were lined up. It was like an ice storm came through because each person would be like doing something personal and then as soon as they saw him, oh, hello, Mr. Holmes. He really, really 
cared about everybody that worked for him, even though he was a tyrant at the office, and people were afraid of him. He would storm around that office. If he was in a bad mood, and he came into that office, a paper clip on the floor could send him into a flying rage of monumental proportions that shook the ground that that office was on. Guards, help. He had that type A personality, and he never felt like he achieved enough. We had gone to see Eva Perone's tomb. Chuck was, came home, and she's going to build a mausoleum. Chuck Holmes is going to build a mausoleum for himself. And I said, why? Who's going to come see it? I said, it's so, and we, we had this discussion. He said, oh, I'm going to build ooh, green marble, and ooh, 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 uh, you know, I'd say, no one's going to come to see it. I said, you're going to be dead and gone. I said, except for a handful of us. I said, we don't have kids. He turned the corner later on and realized that he could donate money, and that would give him a living legacy. It was very important to him that people remember him. He got involved in politics first and foremost because he needed to protect his business. He was really politically motivated around, we couldn't have these goddamn Republicans in office because I'm gonna go to jail. I think I saw everything change, and I think it changed for many of us was the promise of Bill Clinton becoming president. We needed a president who would talk, speak about AIDS, who would say the word AIDS, who would maybe come to our defense and perhaps our rescue. That's when I saw him really begin to contribute heavily. He really was very, very shy about getting into it. And when he met Vincent Freya and Aisha Ken Moore and a couple other people, they encouraged him to say, your money's as good as anybody else's here, and we need you. You're a good leader, you're a good organizer. You can talk people into things that nobody else could talk them into. You can get people on board. We need you. And when he finally got that message, my God, it was on. Because he, he had self-doubt around it. You know, I think that he was always frightened by, or he was frightened by that someone was gonna return his check. I'm Chuck Holmes, I'm from San Francisco, and I'm glad to be here in Washington. This is the first time I've ever marched for a cause in my life. I waited a long time, 48 years almost, and I'm here, and I'm glad to be here. The spirit's very high, everyone's very motivated, and yet very civilized. I know there's people that's not, not rowdy, it's very safe. We're just glad to be here. I hope America wakes up and gets our message. He was part of an emerging, very elite, successful group of gays that had taken it upon themselves to really immerse themselves in politics and use their power and wherewithal uh, to advance gay candidacies and gay issues. He was one of those guys that just melted into the crowd, took everyone in, made them feel welcome. He could sit next to anyone and have a conversation about anything and really, what he did was never really the subject of the conversation. Chuck and I met in a very particular and singular capacity. I as a volunteer fundraiser, he as a very generous donor. Chuck's name was at the top of the list of donors, and so it was my job to, of course, get to know who this individual was and make him my friend uh, so I could continue to encourage his significant contribution to the human rights campaign. Chuck, uh, how, how do you feel about this weekend? I'm very excited about the weekend. It's a big part in our movement for our equal rights for gays and lesbians. 
I expect a million people hopefully will turn the tide for the country or begin to turn the tide in a big way. You're a, a big supporter of the Human Rights Campaign Fund? I do the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> and who are your friends here? This is Steve Schellerbarger, the co-chair of the Board of Directors of the Human Rights Campaign Fund, and Melinda Cuthbert, the Board of Governors of the Human Rights Campaign Fund, and Tim McFeely, our Executive Director. The depth of his generosity made him a significant player. Chuck was a strategic thinker, certainly had an opinion, always had an opinion, and was very welcome as a board member of the Board of Directors. Chuck had the reaches to get to the David Geffens of the world, the Jim Hormels of the world. He would pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, Jim, it's, it's Mary. And that was, you know, Chuck's favorite thing. And, you know, he'd get $100,000 out of him like that. Chuck was a full service activist. He loved to go out and be the great Gadsby and have a good time and hit the town and go to countless parties. He at the very same time was working and being focused and he understood the power he had, and he wanted to apply it in a concentrated way for as long as he could, that his talents and wherewithal would allow him. I would watch him at these events. I'd hear people like Angela Aliotto, or people who were running that year. You gotta meet him, he's got money, he's got money. Shake his hand, meet, meet him, meet him. I'm like, God, crazy? You know, it's like, and Chuck lived off that. You know, he had made it. It fortified whatever negative impression people would ever you know, think about his business. A lot of the people that were his close friends who were big in the political arena were his good friends. He loved them a lot and they loved him back. But there were a lot of other people who were just hangers on. A lot of the people at the Human Rights Campaign and other organizations he belonged to thought of him as just a person in porn who made a lot of money. And I think Chuck always knew that part of the reason these people enjoined him was partially the money. There wasn't so much an issue with HRC and, and taking money from Chuck. Where a lot of the issues came in were in the candidates that we gave money to. So um, some candidates chose not to accept funds knowing that they were coming from Chuck Holmes because of his relationship to the, the gay pornography industry. One of the first openly lesbian candidates to run for Congress was Tammy Baldwin. And I remember a bunch of us in San Francisco putting together and hosting an event for her, and his check wasn't accepted. I mean, it was later given back. gave major doning level to see Clinton before he was elected and they wouldn't allow him in because of what he does for a living. And that crushed him. I mean, that really, I remember he came home from that trip and all he got was a little glass thing. You know, and he goes, well, all I needed was a fucking glass trinket. I couldn't even see the goddamn president. I knew that some prune-faced people might have thought twice about wanting to connect up with Chuck, but it was one, it was so full of hypocrisy because everyone had always been very happy to enjoy his hospitality. And of course, Chuck ran a legal, legitimate business. You know, the community slowly has gotten over its own homophobia, perhaps. Hi, George. Yes. This is one of the few shots where you get to see me. The old man's been let out of the barn one more time. The mushroom, the mushroom <laughs> shot the bar. Now, I don't want to tell them, but you've made my office into a mushroom growing ground where they just keep me in the dark and feed me shit, but that's the truth. There, I said.
Chuck worked. He was a workaholic. He worked all the time. He'd say, I'm Ram Tough. I'm the original Ram Tough model, and they broke the mold after the, I came along. It was true in many ways. He was not, um, he was not sickly. Now, this is somebody who had, early on, a lot of health issues. He was diabetic. He had high blood pressure. He had HIV. He had a liver that, in the end, is what failed him. A lot of the early HIV therapies were very, very toxic and had, had the possibility and probability of liver disease. I think he was run from pillar to post with all the magical therapies. His anxiety and his basic personality forced him to go to that leading edge, if you will. People with liver disease tend to ride along for a while and then just plummet. He had chronic hiccups all day, all night. And the only way to stop them was to inhale anal nitrate. You're talking about a six foot three, six foot four man, very lithe and lanky, now having a very tight belly, just from distension, not from fat, and walking around hiccuping. <laughs> All day. They wanted to remove the spleen, which would stop the hiccups. And I remember the day he went in for the operation, the doctors came in and they said, we are not going to do this operation. You will not survive. You will not come, you will not come off the table. You are in no condition. Stop everything. Go home. We used to call him Mare, because it was French for Mary. <laughs> you know, and he used to say, I'm the old gray mare. It was a term of endearment. So if we really wanted to say, say, oh, Mare. That's how we talked to him. And it was always, it just made him kind of misty-eyed when we called him Mare. When he was passing away, those last uh, few weeks that he was in the hospital, I got to tell him several times, I said, you know, Mary, we fought hard over all these years for a lot of things. And I have to tell you now that I've been in business for myself, is that you were usually right. And he was. It's strange how people die. I got a call from his house boy. He was very ill. Said Chuck was expecting a visitor. Stan is a distributor. He got up that morning, got dressed. He started feeling a little tired, so he said he would lay down. I remember this long, dark hallway to Chuck's room. Here, the door was closed, and that's rare. And I thought, this is weird. So I opened the door, and as I opened the door, I see all these people in a V facing him in his bed. And he was in black sheets, pale white. And as I walked through the door, he goes, <sighs> one breath, I'm not kidding you. It was one breath. And I see all the blood draining out of his face. He's dead. If I hold his hand, and I sat there, and I just said to him, I said, Chuck, I just want to thank you for, for everything that you've done for me. And I just love you so much. And I was looking up, thinking that when you see on TV that people float up when they die and look down, that he might be looking down at me. And that was... When this little bitch came out of the bathroom, who's hiding out in the bathroom, who wanted to hear my conversation. And I was like, one of the money hangers, you know, like one of these people who was there just hanging on for his wealth. Like he probably got all the cats and the dowry and then gave the cats back because he got the money and ran. I mean, all these people were just sucking him. And so that was it. And then I walked out of the bedroom and I walked in the living room and everyone's talking about the paintings and where they're going and what they're doing and who's going to get this, and who's going to get that. And I'm like, whoa, you know, you fucking assholes. He's not even fucking cold and you guys are all fucking dividing everything up. Falcon was a glass castle. It was not a reality. After he died, the glass castle shattered and all the air from the world came in. He was incredibly secure and he was as secure as he was vulnerable. He was filled with enormous self-love and with enormous self-loathing. He forgave immediately and he carried a grudge forever. 
he wanted to control everything and he knew he had no control. And he always doubted. Let's say that he, he knew he was a success, but he kept waiting for someone to come and tap him on the shoulder and say, no, no, it wasn't meant to be you. You weren't supposed to be the success. Out, you're the imposter. I read the headline in the January 31st issue, Center to be named after Falcon Studio founder, and I was filled with disgust. It is no wonder that right-wing advocates and the Christian movement consistently criticize and damn the GLBT community when by this action, it justifies their claim that we are all about sex. So he contributed a million dollars toward the center. Big deal. I, for one, will not contribute another dime. There were some people who thought Chuck Holmes was buying respectability, but you'll always have those prudes who can't face up to the fact that people have sex and didn't think that a person who made his fortune in the sex industry should have his name put on a public building. I think it's good that the Chuck Holmes name is attached to a business and that people have to confront whenever it comes up that that money and the honor being given to him is going to a person who is involved in gay men's sexuality. That's good. Just think of the numberless people that will walk in the building or have already and will in the future. And I think it's important to create more than a Wikipedia paragraph, perhaps. What we brought and what this business continues to bring is a gay connection to people who lead private gay lives or closeted lives out in the Midwest, people who have families or for whatever their circumstances are. I got a letter from a, an elderly woman. She said, please take my husband's name off your mailing list. And I thought, now I'm gonna get it. And she said, I'd like to thank you for all the years of enjoyment that you have brought my husband. He was on your mailing list for 10 years and bought all your movies. He, two years ago, moved to the nursing home, took all his movies with him. This is a woman who had nothing in common with us, no investment to be kind, but she so loved her husband, despite something she couldn't understand, that she was gracious in it in the end. That was a wonderful moment for me, and I thought, we reach more people like this than you know. The one thing none of us should ever, ever forget is this. The image of that young man making his way to San Francisco in search of strength and dignity and self-esteem. And because of his own life, Chuck never, ever forgot the need for each and every one of us to do all things to make a better life in this country and in this city for young gay and lesbian people. And I think what we all know in this room today is that a young gay person could do very well to grow up to be Chuck Holmes. <laughs> <laughs>